Hello, good evening, and welcome to the first episode of TLC TV. Yes, we are here live. Give yourselves a round of applause, guys, in the studio. Yep, the first show, and what a lineup we've got for you. We're going to be talking everything technology, and joining us this week is Tim Grieverson. Tim is the CISO for Aveva PLC and has spent 20 years in the IT and technology space. Also named one of LinkedIn's technology leaders, a far cry from his childhood dream of becoming a chef with only the fact that he can't cook standing in his way. <laughs> Tim Grieverson. <laughs> and also with us this week we have James Linton. James develops email threat awareness training content and has also given talks about his time as an offensive social engineer. After creating headlines as an email prankster, he was able to switch careers and focus on how people can be tricked over email. He is the first social engineer to socially engineer a social engineer. <laughs> James Linton. Joining the panel as well, it's Zoe Dyer. <laughs> Zoe is a global product manager for consumer IoT at Vodafone Smart Tech. Uh, she's lived and breathed product management for over five years and is passionate about the art and science of developing simple solutions that solve painful problems for people. Zoe Dyer. <laughs> Last and by no means least completing the panel, it's Paul Gibson. Paul is the CEO and founder of Relate Group and the Technology Leaders Club. Um, father of three girls, making him the most stressed out member of the panel and the happiest member to be here. And after a year of homeschooling, I'm sure he's happy to be anywhere. <laughs> Paul Gibson. And to close the show this week, we have stand-up comedy from the star of Live at the Apollo and I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here, the very, very brilliant Andrew Maxwell. <laughs> so once again, our panel, Tim Grieverson, James Linton, Sobe Dyer and Paul Gibson. <laughs> Welcome to... Well, welcome to you all. How are we doing? Good, thanks. Good, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. Thanks for having us. Oh, brilliant. Uh, Tim, I'm going to come to you first. You describe yourself as an accidental C CISO. How do you accidentally become a CISO? Well, as you know, I wanted to be a cook, um, but realised I couldn't cook and could burn water. So uh, decided to go into IT. So I've been a CIO, a Chief of Staff, Security Transformation Director, Security wasn't a thing, uh, and no one was doing it, so I fell into it because the company I was working for at the time had a breach, and they needed someone to run to the fire. So a bit like Red Adair, because it was an oil and gas company, I was there to help put out the fires. And and you've, been in the, you've been in the industry for two decades now, so what's the biggest technology change that you've seen? I think the way that technology is enhancing people's lives and, and really growing digital communities. You know, whether it be the autonomous vehicle, whether it be the connected uh, fitness device, clearly, as you can see, I don't use those, uh, right down to, you know, the healthcare of putting, you know, digital connected devices in people's bodies. Okay, and James, uh, what is an offensive social engineer? Because I imagine it to be a social engineer that just doesn't say please or thank you or makes the occasional black joke. <laughs> 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 oh, you're hilarious. Um, <laughs> let's, let's brush past most of that. I don't know what an offensive social engineer... I guess it's somebody who hasn't got permission to be doing what they're doing, I guess, in, like, if you're North Korea, if you're, if you're doing pranks like I did, um, mm -hmm. they're doing something against somebody who um, isn't aware they're doing it, hopefully, otherwise you won't be successful. OK, and... Um Zoe, everyone knows Vodafone, but what is Vodafone Smart Tech? Yep, uh, Vodafone Smart Tech is probably the coolest part of Vodafone. I'm biased and that's my opinion. <laughs> um, we connect devices 
that globally connect to our network and then um, you can look at the things you love and keep track of the things you love from anywhere. Okay. So it's um, really, yeah, what's, right. your, what's your role? What's your department there at Vodafone Smart Team? I am a product manager, very proud product manager. And for anyone that doesn't understand or know what a product manager is, the best explanation I've got is a superhero. <laughs> Hang in there, right? A superhero <laughs> that flies around finding problems and then designs beautiful solutions to solve them. Well, I can't can you imagine go. Superman being called that. There's that product manager. <laughs> <laughs> And Paul, the Technology Leaders Club was the reason why we're all here. So what is that all about? In essence, the, we built the Technology Leaders Club to provide a safe, secure platform for our executive technology community to come together to share best practice, to learn from each other, to lean on their peers and, and ultimately harness and leverage the power of peer-to-peer -peer learning, which is something that you know, as a business we're very, very passionate about. Oh, so this week is all about the year that was 2020, the good, the bad and the ugly. We will be discussing the impact it had on all of us from uh, multiple different points of view, but also the positive impacts uh, that it's made during and since. Um, so what were the immediate impacts that the lockdown, how did it affect your business? Um, well, the first thing it affected me personally uh, within my own business, because I was running a consulting business, the business dried up immediately overnight. Yeah. Uh, I was spent 90% of my life somewhere in an airport and airport lounge visiting clients. So I took the transition to actually go into a permanent role. Um, so I've never actually been to the office and met any of my colleagues over the last 18 months or so, uh, which is, you know, a little bit novel. But we've used it as an opportunity to accelerate the things that, you know, we just hadn't got around to doing, as we enable people to work remotely connect people and actually help educate them on how they can really use the digital and the tech mm -hmm. that we've been throwing at them and spending millions of dollars on in the past. Okay, so how did it affect you personally, Pers the lockdown? Yeah, we, I've always worked with remote teams, so we work in all different countries and a previous problem we had was that we had silos or we were out of sync with each other because we'd, some of us would be online, some of us would be in the meeting room, then you do that really awkward thing where you try and put people on a screen in a workshop with you in the room. So I guess a positive thing that came out for us was that everybody was in the same office, yeah. if you like, because we we're all at home. Mm -hmm. So actually it made collaboration and being able to iterate fast and all the feedback, even user interviews actually really strong for Vodafone Smart Tech. Okay. And uh, James, you, you had a different experience. You were made redundant right at the beginning. Is that right? Yep, that's the technical term. <laughs> <laughs> redundant. Um, yeah, it, it, it was, I think it was about three weeks into it and, you know, like business is business, I guess. and every company was having to establish what shape it had to become to to move into the unknown and obviously some companies thrived and and found their feet on that um some were maybe a bit more cautious i guess and wanted to um give me some time off so <laughs> yeah um but yeah, it was it was kind of it was weird because there, there wasn't any um you know i had no sort of baseline for what searching for a job in Infosec was like anyway uh -huh. but it now being this very online and um, up in the air thing it, it felt even more alien uh, to the point where in the end after <laughs> after having a good laugh at what I'd written down as a, a CV um, I just thought well but, you know I'm actually going to just do my own thing here it just seems easier okay. than trying to convince somebody the companies that haven't done any awareness at all and perhaps don't feel they need to or, or maybe can't even afford to, um, they're the ones that I kind of root for a bit and, and feel like everyone deserves to be safer than they are, not just the people that can afford it. Yeah. I mean, it's very, I always thought it was very weird that that wasn't made to be a bigger deal than what it was during the lockdown because it's yeah. something that everyone would now go through and instead they just spent six months telling people how to wash their hands which is <laughs> i think if you don't know that by the time you're an adult you've got bigger problems really, so. well no sometimes you just aren't shown the right way <laughs> early enough um but yeah it was it was it was an interesting time um and i think like most people it was a time when you, you got to connect with your family again and um, 
sort of um, figure out where everyone was kind of going from there. And then um, I'll ask Paul actually, because being a business owner, how how did the te- how did technology in general play its part in transitioning you from a physical office to now the virtual world of working? Well, I think it was a godsend. You know, um, if we, this had happened 30, 40 years ago, um, I dread to think the impact it would have had on a lot of businesses and the people in it and, and their mental health. I think, you know, we're lucky that we, we live in an age where we have the platforms and the technology available to us that although we can't physically be together, we still can kind of stay semi-connected. So um, for us, you know, using the kind of the online conferencing platforms, your Zooms, your WebExes, you know, it's been a, it's been a dream to, to kind of connect all the team. But... At the same time, we've, our business has grown so bigly. We, we've not met half of the, uh, the company, half the people that we've employed in the last 12 Physically months. Physically met. Mm. Physically, yes. Um, we've, not, we've not met them. Um, so it's, it's been a godsend in one sense, but also at the same time, I think you know, we are starting to miss that kind of human connection and um, you know, the, the camaraderie that's built um, when you can kind of finally get back face to face. Okay. And then, so, Vodafone Smart Tech, so your job already was connecting things remotely. So, were you guys more prepared, would you say, when this happened, it was actually a bit of an easier transition because this is kind of what you do? Um, yes and no. Yes, in the sense that, you know, we're all working in that same office, so it meant similar office hours and a lot more time where you could connect as a bigger group. But personally, I just don't think it's been easy for anyone. It's a sort of shock to the system. It threw, it's thrown some people into the digital space. You know, your, your full elderly category have been almost forced into using digital. It's no, it's no longer, you know, a novel experience to go shopping online or order clothes online it's for some people a necessity and people have had to learn an upskill so I think yeah yes and no is my answer to that and actually it's, it's maybe more connected and more accessible than I wasn't before mm-hmm. because the team now can can actually feel they can come and talk to us mm. whereas previously you know I might have been in an office very busy in meetings right so people can and actually I've become more personalized because I brought my daughter into some of the meetings yeah, yeah. Uh, to, to the point that actually we've given her a title. She's now the head of uh, cyber intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and often she comes up with some really interesting insights into the way that the vulnerabilities are. You tend to be crying quite upset about it, but mm-hmm. people act upon that. Yeah. So you become more personable and approachable right. than you might have been in a, in a physical world. There was that famous video, wasn't there, um, a couple of years ago, um, the guy who was in the BBC News. Oh my God. And um, his video. daughter came running into the yeah. room. Do you remember? Yeah. You know, that guy's basically living our lives now. He was just two or three years ahead of where we all were. So. Yeah. I think you know that was a. It's a good example yeah. of the fact that I think we can empathise with with everyone now, and we definitely find that in our team. There's a lot more empathy amongst each other because you mm-hmm. know a lot of our, our team members have families, wives, children. So you know we've almost kind of got an extended company family because mm-hmm. the partners and the children are just part of our everyday life now. I mean, there was, there was a comment that you made. Um, what was it? I've forgotten now. There's a comment that you made earlier on about had this pandemic have happened 20, 30 years ago, like, how would that have been in comparison? Yeah, I, I think it just be, would be horrendous. Um, imagine the, the suddenly just being isolated from your friends, your colleagues, your, you know, your, your life, basically. You spend more time mm-hmm. normally at work than you do at home. So, so then not to be able to kind of connect and, and keep that community alive, I think would have been really difficult. And I think, you know, you would have had a much bigger impact on people's mental and physical health than, than we've currently had at the moment. And that is mm. down to the fact that we have the technology that we have now. I actually had a conversation with someone who um, said, when, she said, when I grow up and I speak to my grandchildren about this, it will be our version of the Blitz. And I thought, <laughs> it won't, will it, really? <laughs> it wasn't that bad. Like, yeah. you've got Netflix. <laughs> a mask versus a bombshell. Oh, no. it, exactly. Yeah. That you can't imagine people sort of living in the underground and someone going, anyone fancy just eat? Anyone? <laughs> any, <laughs> any, any takers? Like, it's, you wouldn't get delivery down there, it just wouldn't happen. So I think technology has actually really come to the rescue and, and, and saved what, what, what has actually happened. Because even finding out about it, you think without the technology, yeah. Maybe you wouldn't have found it. People would have just brushed it off. Even if it had happened in the 90s, you started coughing. You'd just go, do you know what? He's ill. Let him die. It's fine. <laughs> that would have just happened. No one... You didn't take things as seriously 
then as is done now because we didn't have the information, we didn't have the knowledge. Yeah. That's well, such a good point. Do you know, one thing I was impressed with, how all the countries would get, you know, an announcement and that would be it, everything shut again the next day. Yeah. Because at first I was like, how are they going to reach everyone to tell them exactly what to do? And it was through technology that you had all your instructions, it was online. You had a product, project manager flying around the country. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Faster exactly. than the speed of a train. Getting everyone <laughs> <home>. <laughs> I, I think technology can learn a lot from the, the, the bad actors as well. Yeah. yeah. They've used technology for a long yeah. time to communicate. And, yeah. and, and IT in particular and technologists tend to have been slow adopters to that. Yeah. So actually that connected world that we're now bringing to the business and enhancing and accelerating I do think innovation is, is here. Mm -hmm. well, this um, is we're the, on the, the precipice of doing something really different. The role of IT has now changed. You think many years ago, IT was a service to the business, mm -hmm. yeah. whereas now IT is an enabler to the business, yeah. and it's that generational change which is now making people think differently. Because you think back before, you think, no, I'm not going to... Something as basic as antivirus, no, I'm not going to get that because I've got a Mac. It does, doesn't work that way. Um, a big thing as oh, people have been on is uh, Zoom calls. What's the kind of things you guys enjoy doing on a Zoom call that you can't do in a real meeting? So uh, I think the first one, as, as I've already said, is bringing the family into that call. I thought you were going to uh, say drinking. You know? I definitely thought you drinking. Were gonna... <laughs> <laughs> Eating, as you could probably tell. You know, I'm, <laughs> unfortunately, I've, I've not been very good at, at taking that time away from the. the the desk, you spend a lot more mm. time, you, you know. So one of the things we're trying to do is have 45 minute meetings, mm -hmm. you know, and 50 minutes downtime. So the good thing is we're actually getting more thinking time than we might have had before. Whereas we're going from meeting to meeting to meeting yeah. to meeting. I think the second thing is reaching out to the people, as I said, you know, understanding them more, getting to know the team as, a, 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 you know, as an individual and not just a commodity, delivering an output. Yeah. And uh, just before we go on break, James, I'm going to come to you. What's the worst thing that's ever happened to you on a Zoom call? Um, I mean, when I very first started using Zoom, I remember I was kind of going through a presentation. I think it was just a PDF, so I was flicking through the slides. Um, and I assumed, because I was sharing that screen, I couldn't be seen. Now, my notes, I'd written them quite small, <laughs> having to hold them almost here to read them. It was only afterwards that I found out that everyone could obviously <laughs> see me with these bits, <laughs> bits Hiding of paper. on a Zoom call. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I've got my own back. I've, I've fallen asleep on Zoom calls. Um, I've even got onto a scammer Zoom call with just two people on it as the third person. And I just made the third person called Auto Record or something like that and, and had a, an avatar which was like a, what looked like a record button. Because you don't have to be a perfect um, bit of a technical solution. You only have to be convincing to an extent that they believe, oh, that, maybe that is the thing. So I could just drop onto this two-call Zoom as this fake recording function and, and kind of watch that, that Zoom going on. Oh. As it turned out, it was boring. So I like <laughs> but, yeah. it's, uh, You don't have to really hack into things to, to kind of think that laterally. It's about the the user experience and the, you know, the design of the things that you're interacting with. Because that is a big part of social engineering nowadays. You know, you, you kind of, you, your body language that you're seeing and picking up on is actually the, the visual language you're seeing um, in the email. All right, but we're going to go to a quick commercial break and see you all in a few minutes. Welcome back to TLC TV. Before the break, we were discussing 2020, the good, the bad, and the ugly wallpaper your colleague had, which you would have never normally known about it, but thanks to Zoom meetings, you now <laughs> do. Um, 2020, like, do you know what? My favourite thing with 2020... Doesn't it change, though, how you, you view people when their office persona is, like, super polished and then it flicks to their room and it looks like a fantastic video. I'll tell you what I liked about um, Zoom doing, because we, 
doing comedy, we did a lot of Zoom gigs. And normally, in a club, I could banter with the audience, go, ha, look, look how rubbish your T-shirt is, which is really fun. But the best thing about Zoom is I can judge your personal life. <laughs> like, you can do that with the T-shirt, go, oh, don't like, don't like your T-shirt. But in a Zoom call, go, ha, look how terrible your house is. That part was a lot of fun. <laughs> But um, do you know what? With my favourite thing with 2020 is that we all thought that 2019 was bad. Do you, like, do you guys remember <laughs> yeah. 2019 and towards about November, December time, how positive people started getting? Like the amount of times yeah. I saw on Facebook, on Instagram, people going, 2020 is so going to be my year. Like, <laughs> I thought the irony of that is just brilliant. Like all the stuff that would have happened in 2019, now you'd think, nah, it's not that bad. I mean, what was your, what were the, some of the sort of disaster stories that happened to you guys over, over 2020? Because people, like, you've got to take the fun away from a lot of these things. So what, what were the fun things that happened to you? Fun, embarrassing, absolutely anything. I want to go to Paul, actually. Uh, well, my most embarrassing story over lockdown is um, I accidentally told a lady who I was buying some shoes from that I love her. <laughs> um, so I meant to say lovely, thank you, um, and with my darling wife stood next to me, proceeded to tell her that I love her, um, <laughs> which uh, was highly embarrassing and we've never been back to that shop since. Oh, well, as a couple, you've been back, obviously. <laughs> oh, I, many a time. Because he loves her. <laughs> what was the uh, something bad that happened to you? Uh, I... Um, I mean, not really bad, but I remember when I first walked into a supermarket with my with my mask on, I had this strange um, sort of feeling that it was like I was wearing mirrored sunglasses at the same time. It was like my eyes were autonomous and couldn't be seen, as well as my face being blocked. So that was a slightly weird... It wasn't like... I don't want to bring any associations with what men can sometimes do with mirrored sunglasses, but it, it was this kind of weird how much of me is blocked off. It was like I, I couldn't really predict where my feet were going to go. Um, I think it says more about my spatial awareness than anything, <laughs> that a little bit of cotton across my face can completely destroy me. You, you mentioned something early on um, about a particularly bad Zoom call that you had. Oh, the redundancy one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sure I wasn't the only one uh, that had that. I mean, it would have been uh, physically and legally impossible for that to be done face to face. <laughs> that's, that, that's another thing that has made it a lot easier. Rather than spending the whole day making people redundant, invite everyone onto one Zoom call and let them all know <laughs> you don't work here anymore. Yeah, yeah. It was. Uh, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I was laughing after. <laughs> oh, what's the worst thing that's happened to you? Or what's the funniest thing that's happened to you on a Zoom call? So I think. It's that constant going from one meeting to another. Mm. And I'd woken up late, I was rushing to the meeting, you know, I'd started throwing clothes on and the, me the, the meeting had started. So I rushed down, sat down, had this hour meeting. Um, and, and then I realised I'd forgotten to put my trousers on. <laughs> uh, it would have been okay, but during the call, right near the end, the doorbell went. Oh, so no. as I stood up, it was at that point that I reminded myself I'd forgotten to put my trousers on. <laughs> and uh, that was a very short conversation from that point on. Fortunately, I was wearing, uh, you know, boxer shorts, but, but the trousers was uh, uh, put down in history in the office. I like the fact that you just answer the door in your pants and that's the part that's fine. It <laughs> <laughs> uh, was back, the battle with the... your partner over who was, who was the most dressed to answer the door if the doorbell went. It was, a, you know, like... I'm dressed properly from the top half down. It's like, I've got socks on that have got holes in. I'm not going to the door. And you end up with this weird kind of battle thing going on. Um, and it's the constant doorbell with Amazon as well, isn't it? You know, during one, lockdown. The one thing I wish they do keep, though, is having that kind of three metre barrier when you open the door now, if somebody's there, rather than them being you know, this close to you. I do I, I'm, I'm all up for the, for the gap. I'll tell you what was weird. I, uh, there was a point where we were still in quite the height of lockdown and Boris Johnson came out and said, right, from this date, you will now be allowed to stand one metre mm. close to somebody. And I thought, who stands that close to yeah. someone anyway? Yeah. Like, that's... I don't like my kids being that close to me. <laughs> that, that's, you, I, I, two metres is a normal, sensible distance. Any closer than that, you might as well hug that stranger. <laughs> it's not something... I, I've always thought that that gap was a weird number. Plus, I always thought it was funny 
that he thinks that viruses can't tell space. Like you're going to get to two meters and go, oh, we've got to stop there, guys. <laughs> the little laser pointer out. Yeah, yeah. It's sort of gone out of range. Uh, back to technology, and of course, there's another side um, of the technology coin, and that's end users. Um, how do you think this has changed the end user perspective in terms of security? Do you think people now are more aware? I think they are. I think um, people are now thinking of how they can protect themselves, but it, it takes effort. Mm. So, you know, we've invested a lot of time in awareness training, so situation awareness, but not just for work. Mm -hmm. but also how they can protect themselves in their digital lives. So if you personalise it to them, how can they protect their families? It's much more impactful. Um, there's still a long way to go, mm -hmm. but you know, people are now recognising that they need to do something extra given mm -hmm. they're working from home. Uh, they're not travelling, so you know, we've, we've got less of an impact of them leaving the laptop on, you know, on the train or in the taxi. But it's still, what do they now think about when they're clicking on something? Yeah. You know, so it does take time. But I think they are becoming more aware as they start to learn the technology. You know, my parents phoned me up the other week saying, look, I've had this funny email come in. You know, I've won uh, $50 million, <laughs> but I'm not going to click on it. You know? And previously, yeah. they would have probably opened that up, clicked on it to say, just to see what it was, mm -hmm. rather than actually now starting to think. So I, I do think there has been a, a change over the last you know, 12, 18 months. Do you think that's because people's work life and home life are kind of merging closer together? I do think there's a convergence, yes. I mean, as you know, Paul, you know, we've spoken before about converged security, where I talked about the physical world and the virtual world coming mm -hmm. together. I think that's collided and crashed, you know, and the tsunami of stuff that's coming blew your us. pants off. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. You know? it, it's really that colliding together of those personas now. So it's more about protecting your digital assets and your personal persona to bring your own identity yeah. um, or you know, bring your own disaster, as I used to call it, has really changed now to how do I include my digital life, my personal life, and bring those into a morphed, cohesive way. You think now your digital life is your personal mm. life, It is. You know, it? You're shopping online now. To get, you have to make sure you get your slot or yeah. your, you know, your, your delivery or your ordering your medicines. People who perhaps never used technology before are forced into using it yeah. because we're not able to leave the house. Yeah. Haven't yeah. been able to leave the house. It's such a good point. I think people do not buy things, they buy feelings. And the same way you want to excite them about an experience in an app or you know, shopping online, you want to make them feel safe. And if you don't, you know, first impressions count. Or if you muck up once, they, they ain't coming back to your e-commerce shop or using your services again. And, you know, word of mouth is going to sink you too. Well, bad reputation online spreads yeah. a yeah. lot quicker than it would in the, in the real world, wouldn't it? I, yeah. I think that's part of the change. People are now thinking more about the, the people that they do business with. Yeah. It's that, um, you know, that, that health and hygiene of the business. You know, so we as a business have focused really hard on our external um, capabilities and the way that we can actually protect our digital footprint. Mm -hmm. and, and what does our organization look like from a scorecard yeah. view? You know, you'll have a credit score, but where is our standing in cyber security? Because organizations, whether it be M&A, whether it be you know, your connection to your customer, expect their data to be looked after, to be mm -hmm. private. Yeah. Uh, we put out a couple of questions on to LinkedIn prior to the show. Um, some of the questions that came back, does cloud computing need regulating? Yes. How would that? How would you? How would you regulate cloud computing? I mean, isn't it already regulated to an extent? I think it is. I think the, the, the challenge is, is the the standards. What is the standard expectation? Hmm. Um, you know, we 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 chase very much the technology. Cloud isn't anything new. Cloud has been around for many, many years. You know, it's connected computers. It was around 20 years ago when I started technology, just very different. But I think what we need to do is not just have a regulation, because regulations don't mean you're secure. It's actually have the basics and then really articulate what that needs to look like and how does it enable the business in a safe way rather than thinking of security afterwards. Because I'm seeing vendors now coming to us and saying, well, you can have this flavor as basic but if you want security, you have to buy this enhanced yeah. version. Mm. Why is that? Yeah. I would expect that as a basic level of entry, a bit like health and safety. Yeah. Why am I having to mm -hmm. pay more money to protect my data? Yeah? It's a bit like insurance, isn't it? 
Yeah. No, they regulate insurance, why, why not? Yeah, so I think it should be regulated. They regulate everything else. You think they regulate loans, any, mm. anything like that. So it should be regulated because there's already, there's how many different bodies of, you think you've like, you, you, G, GDPR, you, you think, what's the ISO 27001? There's all these different ones. Would it be easy if there was one common standard for everyone to be regulated by? Then after that, who regulates it? Mm -hmm. I think that would be a utopia, but I think there is very different challenges in mm -hmm. different geographies. And I've done a lot of work in the Middle East, and I've done work in Germany and, uh, and you know, activities in the Netherlands. And there is local oh, requirements. Yeah, yeah. it's <laughs> tough. It is tough to try and get everybody's buy in it, because otherwise it's, it's regulation by committee. Yeah. And you're never going to get that through. Mm. So I think, for me, standards are important, regulations are important, but actually focusing on the real basics is more important. You know, I'm not going to chase a certificate no. to say I've got ISO 27001 or NIST or whatever the others are, GDPR. It's, am I doing the right things to protect my customers and my employees? And by doing that, actually, I start to bring those regulations in flight. So it doesn't matter whether it's NIST, GDPR, you mm -hmm. should be doing the right basic things automatically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. um, another question that came in uh, to you all, should G20 countries align to make it illegal to pay ransomware? It's a great question. I, I'm not sure. I, I'm honestly, I don't think I've got enough background knowledge as to the, the technical side of things and how that plays out or any kind of, because the thing with these ransomware attacks is, that although some companies do kind of give a bit of a step through, um, most companies want to talk as little about it as possible, mm -hmm. quite rightly, I guess. Um, so yeah, I just don't feel I understand it enough to know if it'd be a good or... There seems to be a case for both things, so it's... The way, the way that I saw it was, imagine if your child was taken hostage and someone yeah, asked yeah. for ransom, yeah. and would you want to be afraid of getting in trouble of paying it to get your child back? Mm. I'll give you my view, not that of my company. Mm -hmm. um, you know, paying a ransom doesn't actually mean you're going to get your data back. No. And, and once you've given your, um, your, your ransom and paid it, Will you get it in a timely enough manner? Will it be in the format that you can consume? Or actually, does that not say, actually, I'm a target. Come and ransom, attack mm -hmm. me again. And that's what we're seeing. They're, you know, the bad actors are using a ransomware to distract while doing a DDoS attack, while also yep. doing a malware attack and then also do phishing. So they're using a connected way of attacking companies and organizations. But it's a commodity now. Yep. You know, we're seeing ransomware as a service. Oh, that, that's, that's, uh, I don't know if you guys are seeing this ransomware as a service. You can, there's literally websites. And the, the funny thing about these websites is they've been developed to a high standard. They look really good. <laughs> and like they're saying, come and pay us a subscription and you can download the ransomware. You can send it off to whoever you want. And then they will take a commission off the money that you take from the company. Oh, so you're like an affiliate for them? Yeah. Pretty, pretty much. In a previous role, not the current role, we were actually chasing a criminal gang and their security was excellent. Yeah. If I knew who they were, I would have employed them yeah. because they had a proper WAF and they were protecting their data and they had controls in place to stop you taking them down and their crypto mining capability was brilliant. So actually they've commoditized like a business. Mm. Yeah. They really are. They've got a marketing team. They've got a an HR team recruiting <laughs> the best and smartest people. Oh, can you imagine a marketing team for theft? So, mm. guys, so how, how can we humanise robbery? <laughs> the internet of theft. We, we need a logo. Yeah. Something that says we're going to rob you and ruin your life, but something that also says, let us in. Yeah. yeah. It's funny, but it's a great point. You can innovate for good or bad, right? Just as fast. And we should learn. As an industry, we should learn from that. Yeah. You know, no disrespect to, your, to, you know, to Vodafone, because they do some really good innovative stuff. But as an industry, we should learn more from mm -hmm. what the bad actors are doing mm -hmm. and try and get into that psyche. You know, a bit like you were saying earlier on, is thinking like that bad guy. And getting into the psyche then actually allows you to build and design and, and secure your business. It shouldn't be something extra. Mm. It should be really baked in and culturally as part of your ecosystem as a business. You know, oh, you CISOs don't always report to the board. Maybe they should and there's a whole conversation there around where they sit and report. I think businesses in many cases, don't realise how much power they actually own because I think this is something that businesses should demand from the from whichever vendor they're dealing with for whichever product. It's the same way 
if, because you, the thing is, you wouldn't settle for this in any other part of your life. Mm. Every, every year, what happens with the car insurance? They try and put it up for some stupid reason. I got told my car insurance was going to go up because there were more accidents in my era, even though I had nothing to do with them. <laughs> but there's still more accidents to learn, so we're going to put your premium up. So I said, no. All right, cancel it. I'll go somewhere else. And then very quickly, they kept it down. The same thing. And it's the same, you think, phone contracts. Every year, you negotiate a better deal and a better rate. So in our personal lives, we do that. But when it comes to business, companies seem to not do that. So do you, do you think that's something companies should start doing in order to start taking that control back? It's like getting a, a meal in a restaurant and the chicken arriving 80% cooked. <laughs> And it's like, well, you can pay a little bit more and, you know, have <laughs> absolutely no chance of shitting yourself, but you can pay a little bit less. Yeah, and I think we regulate by contracts as well. You know, we build in SLAs for failure. Yeah. Yeah. We should build in SLAs and OLAs for success. Yeah. You know, we'll pay you more money if you over-deliver yeah, rather than taking money from you. So, you know, where we try and do it is get the, the vendors to become real partners. Know, partnership with us, put some skin in the game. Mm. And if you, know, you are failing, then clearly you want to be penalised. But if you overperform and you enhance the security or the capabilities, give you something back. That'll then grow both of our business communities and, and be much more successful than, than beating people up for failure. We, certainly as a society, thrive on people's failure. If you look at the media every day, and I'm not knocking the media, you chase you know, this organization's had a breach and everybody comes to the, the pump and they've done this and they haven't done this. Why don't we all as a community, as a security community, help those individuals in pain yeah. rather than beating mm -hmm. them up for what they didn't have in place, the controls they weren't doing. You know, I personally will reach out to organizations if they've had a massive breach to say, can we help you? And even if it's after, if we have to come and make pizzas for your staff or, you know, you know get We've established capabilities. You can't cook. <laughs> <laughs> Buying pizzas, not cooking the pizzas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's that sort of coming together. Yeah, I yeah. think if we came together as a, as a community of security professionals, actually we're much stronger. You know, again, bad actors, they communicate. They work together. You know, they come together and they build, you know, an attack against an organisation or a community of organisations. Why, why can't we do that? Well, that's, that's part of a selfish plug, but that's part of the reason why the Technology Leaders Club was yeah. built in the first place, was to yeah. try and give a platform for you know, senior executives to come together and share war stories, right? Yeah. Um, wh who else better to learn from than your peers that have either gone through something similar or are going through something? And then where can you go and who can you lean on? Yeah. Um, so I think it's a really good point. Um, also, you, you mentioned about uh, kind of vendors Looking at um, cyber insurance, we got asked this question about six months ago on one of the virtual roundtables that we hosted around, is there, is there an avenue or is there a link for cyber insurance to be pinned on or working alongside the vendors that you work with so that if you, if you buy a product or you bring a vendor into your, your business, you can insure against that vendor so that if they don't deliver what is on their contract to deliver, you have an insurance policy to back you up as a business if, for example, you have a ransomware attack and you are forced to pay it. So is that insurance that would cost charge, would be chargeable to the vendor to pay the end user if something goes wrong? Don't know. It was a question that was thrown into the group, but I'd, I'd be interested in your take. Mm. It's a difficult one. I, I mean, how much do you insure for? You know, if it's a GDBR fine, it could be a massive amount of money and then the premium is higher than you can actually afford. You know, it's that balancing act, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but I think that, that coming together and that partnership could really add you know, some value to that. Um, my views out on cyber insurance and whether it is worth the money or not, because the chances of you actually getting back the recoverable amount that you're going to lose, because it's the reputable damage rather than the actual loss, that is really tough. And we've seen some it's, really it's big organisations that have well, lost that. Do you think the way that normal insurance works, if my car gets stolen, if it's that sort of case, I will just get another car and I can on my day. But if your data's stolen, how do you replace that? That They might give it back, but they've, they can still have it. Just because they've sent it back mm. yeah. doesn't yeah. mean that they haven't copied it and sold it on. And that's the thing. They could be using it, not today, but they could be holding on to that data and use it two years down the line. Mm. And you've already made that claim. Can you then go back and then make a second claim on that yeah. data? Uh, so, so my view is I think there's a need for it. But where does it fit in the ecosystem of the other controls and the other capabilities? 
user awareness, you know, at what part will it actually add the value and hit your maximum amount of, of penetration in terms of protecting your business? Yep. And I'm not sure. I think it's probably fine to not be sure, even though I've not got a huge amount of experience in security. I mean, it's just a fact that the internet isn't all that old and all these mm. things are kind of evolving at such a rate and in so many different directions and so many different vendors and all this that the answer today or this minute might not be the same answer that you'd give tomorrow type thing. So I think we've just got to get used to the being, yeah. trying to do your best and, and making a judgment call. So what, do, you, do you think then that we are constantly playing catch up to the internet? Uh, in, in terms of it being secure, yeah, I would say so, definitely. Because at the end of the day, you can't 100% trust an email is from who it says it's from. And the same thing has now happened with SMS messages. So mm -hmm. we've kind of got, you can imagine the consumer, they're like, right, so we can't, we can't, <laughs> can't believe that, we can't believe that. Okay, uh, <laughs> you know, it's a kind of, perplexing that we can't seem to get on top of that. I, you know, I wouldn't even try to imagine how that would even be possible if it was, but it is, um, it, it kind of shows that, you know, it's not going to be as easy as maybe the internet seemed to be when it first sort of started appearing as technology races ahead. Um, you know, everyone else is, you know, some people will choose to fly a drone on Mars rather than deal with the the current day-to-day -day problems that we have um, or people face in this country. And cybercrime is a, is a billion dollar, if not more, business for the bad actors. Yeah, yeah, multiple. You know, so they're spending and investing and building that ecosystem. Mm. You know, you're, you're always going to be chasing it. You know, never giving me the biggest budget will solve the problem yeah. or all of the mm. problem. It's knowing where to put your, your pounds, your dollars, your euros. Um, digital transformation is the, pretty much the la last question. So is this something you think has been achieved or do you think it's ever-changing? Will we ever achieve digital transformation? I, I love like the internet and, and all the different things that you can do and um, just having all this data that you can devour but I've also come to the conclusion that it's actually not good for me to have that much stuff and try and force it into your head so at the minute from a, a kind of um, a bit more of an ethereal overview. I'm trying to kind of cut down the number of email addresses I've got, cut down the number of apps that I've got, just to simplify it because I think, um, you know, it's like having a load of cake. I, I just seem to be feeling a bit sick with this constantly connected thing. And I think it's built within us all and bred yeah. within us all through all the social media sites to, to kind of almost become, you know, the rats hitting the, the thing for the, for the treat type thing. So. Yeah, I think there'll be a stage where the digital transformation has gone too far. And that's what annoys me about saying, oh, the human firewall, you know, it's the weakest part of the human. It's like, these are bloody humans. <laughs> this is designed for humans to use it. If you take them away, it's nothing. It, you know, it's a couple of chatbots talking to each other, so. Right, thank, thank you guys for joining us today. Uh, we're going to have one last commercial break and then we'll be back with our comedy actor of the, of the evening, um, Andrew Maxwell. So we will see you shortly. digital security enthusiasts. <laughs> I hope you've changed your pin recently. By the way, if you're English, it's more than likely 1066. <laughs> and if you're Irish, it's more than likely 1916. Everybody's quite obvious. It's, <laughs> we just looked over a plant in the background. It's wonderful to be here in Zoomlandia amongst you. Has everybody else got used to speaking to their relatives from weird angles from their iPads? Yeah. This is, uh, I don't know about you, this is how I speak to my mother for the last year. Hello, son! <laughs> Hello! 
It'd be weird gigs. For the last year, us comedians, uh, we've had a choice of either trying to do gigs on Zoom or doing drive-in gigs. If you haven't experienced what a drive-in gig, that is cars parked in an amateur rugby club pitch, and you're then another hundred meters away on the, on the stage. Well, they tune in to AM radio to listen to you like it's the 1950s in Milwaukee. <laughs> and originally we were told that we'd be able to know that the audience were enjoying it in their parked cars a hundred meters away because they'd be allowed to honk their horns in appreciation. But then all across the land, uh, councils banned that. So you're just basically a man <laughs> shouting at parked cars, <laughs> which is both really unpleasant for a comedian, but you're also taking another man's job because that's the job of the village idiot. <laughs> Screw it. This is, anyway, we had some weird experiences as comedians on Zoom. This is the worst of it. So you basically, what happens is, often people are watching on their smart TVs in their living room, and there'll be a couple, and one of the couple likes you, but the other member of the couple is living just in their living room, right? And somebody will laugh, this is what happened, my first Zoom gig last summer. You know, there was, it was on the gallery screen, and somebody had laughed pretty loud, right? And it, then next thing, I'm looking at this couple, and the guy's laughing and smiling, so he's clearly the one who decided this is what they were watching on TV that evening. His missus is beside him on her phone. He laughed really loud at something. And this is, honestly, I've had some cruel heckles in my time, but this is heckles in the world of Zoom. This is what it looks like. She just looked up and went, That's the world we're living in, team. It's quite intimidating, actually, when you start doing Zoom gigs for the first time. But, it, you know, what you do is, as a comedian, you've just got to think back to what it was like before that. Like, I've been doing stand-up for 30 years, right? When I first year at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, I was 20, and I was on stage at one in the morning every night for a month in a place called the Cowgate, right? Which is, is basically a drain where they send hen down, right? <laughs> I was dying on my arse. There was this old Scottish boy in the front row, and not only did he not laugh, audibly on every punchline, he could be heard saying, oh, for fuck's sake, <laughs> shite, shite. Eventually I snapped. I was like, it's grumpy Scottish men like you that'll mean Scotland will never have a Disneyland. <laughs> You imagine being a Mickey Mouse in a Scottish Disneyland, just trying to spend a bit of American corporate joy in your rain-sodden costume. <laughs> Scottish dads trying to impress their estranged children. Come, son, he has to take it. <laughs> That's the world I've come up in. But here we are, now we're in the world of Zoom. And now we're getting vaccinated, people. We're following the rules, and finally it's coming true, team. I have personally, I don't know about you, I've been extremely proud of the people who've actually put the effort in, realised they live in a society and we all have the same set of lungs and we should look after each other. And then there's the pricks. <laughs> and the extent to which the pricks will go to be pricks has blown my mind, right? This is in January of this year, a hundred doggers in Glasgow in January. <laughs> broke the rules to meet up to do dogging in a Glaswegian car park. There was a hundred of them in a car park. I, I can only assume it was pay and display. <laughs> <laughs> you see, in the world of Zoom, nobody can throw their pint at me for terrible, terrible jokes. <laughs> oh, the world, when it opens up, we'll be able to travel again. How good will that be? For us comedians, that's where we get our material from moving around the earth. It's not the same just clicking on and off pages. You know? France! Has anybody here been to France? Have you been to France? Yeah. God, I love the French. The French know how to live, don't they? Yeah. They know how to live! They, they don't know how to work, but they know how to live. They've got cake for breakfast. <laughs> 
It's, it's only a pan au chocolat. It's chocolate cake! <laughs> what have we got for breakfast on these benighted islands? What have we got? We the Bix. What is it? We've been eating this shit for a hundred years. We still don't know whether it's better with hot milk or cold milk. All we know for certain is if you turn your back on the Weedabix, the spoon won't move. <laughs> How bad can your day be if it starts with chalky cake? Your boss is giving you shit. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm really struggling to give a shit what y'all saying to me right now because I am incredibly full of cake, huh? Incroyable. Have you been to Paris? Yeah, they're all scaling up, aren't they? They want to be the center of the fintech sector, whatever that is. I skim through The Economist. <laughs> I look at the pictures, I see what's going on. Paris, it's meant to be an equal of London. This is where we are, by the way, right now in Zoomlandia. We're in London. Paris is meant to be equal to London. Have you ever actually been to Paris? It's meant to be intensely romantic, but that's, that's just the Eiffel Tower and the bridge that's groaning with locks. Right? The rest of it, there's just dog poo everywhere. That's just how the French live. Their dogs poo in the street and they just, they just leave. You want to grab them by the shoulders and go, what is wrong with you, Jean-Claude Francois? Why can't you live like us islanders? Sometimes known as the British, sometimes known as the Irish. We have dogs, of course we have. They poo in the street, of course they do, they're dogs. But then we got a little scented bag and we pick the dog shit up. And then, inexplicably, hang it in a tree. <laughs> so we explain that to somebody. Italy, God, I miss Italy. The food, the food. Has anybody ever been to Italy? Yeah. The food. Oh my God, they're the, best. the Italians are the greatest cooks on earth. Which makes it all the more baffling what I'm about to tell you. We have an Italian community in Ireland. They've been there since the 1950s. And they own all our chip shops. <laughs> just, don't just stop and walk yourself back from that statement. <laughs> it means these Italians came in the 1950s to Ireland and went, Who's angry? Who wants to eat? Come on, you tell me, sky's the limit, imagination, no, no bounds. What do you like? I'll make it for you, let's eat, come on. Who wants food? What do you like? Chips! <laughs> we want chips, Luigi! Who is this, like a little deep fry, chop up potato, little potato soldiers, is he? Okay, well you sit down and uh, prepare yourself for the meal and I will make enough of these chips, you say, chips for the two of us because food is a social occasion and we will eat together. No, Luigi, I want them in a bag. I want them in a bag and I'm gonna eat them in the rain looking back in at you. <laughs> That's Ireland. That's the madness. Germany, have you ever been to Germany? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yes. I've got into it, people. I own lederhosen. <laughs> yes. Any, any of the men in the room here ever worn lederhosen? Oh, I can't recommend them enough, boys. <laughs> Oof, and there's no pants involved. It's just man and leder. <laughs> the comfort, oh, it's like being cupped by a chamois hand. <laughs> they just have a different way in Germany. They're just about their bodies. They're not like us islanders. They'll get naked at the drop of a hat. And the older they get, the more naked they just get. They're just naked. They're naked in parks. They don't even know they're naked. It's just somebody's granny or granddad just bollock naked in a park. But it's, what's mind blowing to us islanders is you just start, you're like, how is this happening? There's no acknowledgement that they're naked. I did a student exchange when I was a teenager to Bavaria. And my first afternoon there, after lunch, the dad just walked through the living room, naked. Nothing. No acknowledgement. And that's, so, that's the thing that unites everybody on these two islands. No matter what your background, your political opinions, where you're right, left, pro, anti-Brexit, doesn't matter what your identity is, your religion, your class, the one thing that unites everybody on these two islands 
is for us, for a man to just walk into a room naked and not even acknowledge the fact that he knows he's naked is incredibly rude. <laughs> for us islanders, it is considered polite if you are to walk into a room naked as a man, to at least acknowledge the fact that you know you're naked by simply going, Wee. <laughs> like, Nobody trains us. Nobody trains us that instinct. It's been a year. Over a year. A year and three months of lockdowns of all sorts, people. What have I learned? You've got to learn something, don't you? What have I learned? What have I learned? What I've learned is that uh, when your wife asks you to do something, just do it. <laughs> like seriously, I've been married for years, it never occurred to me. Before that, I was in a very long-term relationship. Like do it straight away. <laughs> like do it then. Stop whatever you're doing and just do it. And now we've got another kid on the way. <laughs> That's it. Got lockdown baby, baby number four is coming next month from lockdown loving. Just do what she says straight away. Unbelievable. Number four, obviously we don't know what it is. All we know is it's a baby. I don't really care gender wise, you know. I love babies. I just love them. I love them when they're around two. I love toddlers. Do you know what I love about them? They drink like Vikings. <laughs> you ever been around a baby? You'll know what I'm talking about. There's no sipping when you're a baby, is there? Either you're either drinking or you're not drinking. <laughs> yeah. They got a little yellow beaker with two handles that looks like a stolen chalice from a faraway abbey. It's <laughs> a little bit of detail for you. They just grab it like that and just go, Arg! 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 <laughs> I've shit myself. <laughs> and I want you to clean it up. <laughs> okay, Olaf. We've got quite a range of children. Uh, I had a kid in my 20s, a kid in my 30s, had a kid in my 40s. It's quite the spread, isn't it? As a friend of mine rightly pointed out, you're the Cliff Richard of breeding. <laughs> I've just had one hit a decade. So you stay relevant, people. And now lockdown, baby. The eldest, he's 20. Teenage boys. Jesus. He's out of it now. He's now he's a 20-year-old. But there's a point. Nobody trains you. Nobody tells you these things. That there's a point when your boy becomes a boy wolf man thing. <laughs> Otherwise known as puberty, that they, they stink. <laughs> it's an unbelievable, there's nothing, just a game. One day you walk down into the living room on a Saturday morning and it, there's just this gamey stank in the house. It just, it's like somebody's ran over a dead deer and dragged it in the house. That's the, it's only when you actually live with a teenage boy you realise what Lynx is. It's for breeze for boys. <laughs> Let it just cut through the stank. I've got two daughters. Boys are stinky, you know, but daughters, like, it's a totally different. It's a psychological warfare there. You haven't got a chance. As long as, as a dad, you instantly surrender and don't even remotely try and win any battles against your daughters because you haven't got a clue. You haven't got hope. Because they're planning. They're thinking it through. Their daughters, they're already thinking when they're in the womb, right? <laughs> With a little boy, you actually have to ask a little boy a question to activate the thinking, right? <laughs> daughters, they're in the womb. They're in the womb thinking how they can outwit their dad. They're already in there. They're planning. They're thinking. Will you go for the third trimester scan with your missus and, you know, and the midwife and the obstetrician is going, oh, see that bump moving across there? That's the baby kicking. Not if it's a daughter. That's her ear. <laughs> she's got her ear up to the womb wall and she's listening out for who, which one of the Egypts out there is my dad. This is what I'm talking about. My three-year-old daughter, okay, when she was two, we were teaching her, this is what I'm talking about. This is the daughter thing. We were teaching her the colors, right? Got all these little colored blocks. And she'd sit beside me on the couch and I would point at the blocks, you know, to teach her. 
So I go, What's, what color is that one? What color is that one? That one. What color is... Well, being a daughter, she's just quite happy to ride out the social awkwardness of the situation. She's quite happy to just sit there, passively, waiting, till eventually I just snap under the social pressure and go, Red! <laughs> it's red! It's red. And she would turn around and put her little hand on my knee and turn around to me and go, Yes, that's right. <laughs> it's the daughter war. You cannot win. <laughs> it's families. We'll see. We'll see how this whole lockdown goes. We're all, see, we're all learning. We're all learning how to do stuff online. The Zoom thing. It's all different. You know? Corporate Zoom events. That's, you know, also strange. This, you've been a very nice audience, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I've never done a gig where there's more potted plants than people. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is exactly 52 potted plants and seven people from the tech sector. <laughs> you know what I mean? You just don't know. You have to, with every gig, you just, gotta, you just don't know. And that's essentially the reality of online security. You don't know, right? Never assume anything. You call them back. And then you call them back on a different number. Just assume you're getting done over, because you are getting done over. Same with corporate gigs. My, the weirdest one I ever had, right? I did a gig, and you just don't know what will trigger people, what will upset people. Right? You don't. Right? I did this gig for the biscuit industry a couple of years back. Now, this is all the big wigs of the biscuit game. All the, big, the biggest names in the biscuit game were all gathered for like a secret conference, like the Davos of biscuits. This was the highest, most high-powered people in the biscuit industry. The big bicky men, right? There was about 10 of them in a stately home in Oxfordshire. And I was like, oh, they're out in a veranda, these 10 dudes. And I was like, oh, this is gonna be brutal. This is gonna be terrible. They were actually fantastic. They were great. They were really nice people just like you. Very attentive, very giving audience, right? And that's the only reason I said this, right? I only, I only said what I said because they were nice. At the end of the gig, I went, listen, you've been fantastic. You know, I've never worked for the biscuit industry before. You've been really wonderful. Uh, can I, before I go, can I just ask you a question? They're like, yeah, ask away. And it's, it's about biscuits. They're like, yeah, just knock you to ask anything. This is, as far, this is as far as I got before the whole shit house went up in flames. This is all I got to say was, wagon wheels. <laughs> no! I was like, yeah, but remember when you were kids, your hands were smaller! <laughs> you just don't know. So when a gig goes well enough and the plants have enjoyed it, <laughs> take your curtsy, you do what you can, you get through it together. Thank you very much, team. I really appreciate it. <laughs> the applause going guys that is all from us this week uh, make sure you tune into the next show on the 17th of july where we will be discussing the evolution of endpoint security so thank you all for joining us and good night yeah.